we have this technical word in English. It's, it's a philosophical word. It's the word phenomenological. And it means things as they appear. The Bible sometimes uses phenomenological language. In other words, it uses the language of appearance. And apparently, a man came to Jacob while he was alone. Because verse 24, it says, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him in the darkness until the sun rose. Well, the more we read the passage, we realize it's not just a man. But Jacob thought it was a man. So the Bible is be, the report is given from the beginning in terms of the perception of Jacob. Somehow Jacob started wrestling with a man. Maybe it was one of Esau's men. Maybe it was the first man who came to kill him. And so he begins to resist and he begins to wrestle. But in verse 25, um, it says that that man touched Jacob in such a way to injure him, in such a way to give him pain, in such a way that he really couldn't walk anymore. And now Jacob is weak and he's hurting and he knows he can't win. But by this time, he knows that it's not just a man. It's something more than a man. So this person says to him, let me go because the sun is coming up. We've wrestled all night. Jacob says, I won't let you go. I won't let you go until you bless me. Now here's the question. Who has the power to bless Jacob? Jacob says to him, uh, uh, the man says to him, what is your name? Okay, now think about this. This is Genesis 32. The last time Jacob asked for a blessing, at least the last time he asked a man for a blessing, he asked his father, his father Isaac. When his father Isaac said, Who are you, my son? He said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. So Jacob asked for a blessing, and his father said, What's your name? And he said, My name is Esau. Now in chapter 32, he asks for a blessing. And this person says, What's your name? He said, My name is Jacob. He's telling the truth. And then the person says to him, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have wrestled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob says, Now you tell me your name. Well, here are two questions. Who's big enough to bless Jacob? Secondly, who has the authority to give Jacob a new name? I have three children. I name them. I named them because they were mine. I have two grandchildren. I wanted to name those two grandchildren. I couldn't because they weren't mine. You only have the authority to name somebody if they belong to you. We name our children. We don't name somebody else's children. This man named Jacob. This is a very important passage of Scripture because it's the first place in the Bible we see the word Israel. Now Jacob has two names. The word Jacob, which means deceiver, cheater, or usurper, not a very flattering name. And the name Israel, the one who fights with God the one who fought with God and won. 
So Jacob says to this person, what's your name? And it says that he blessed, he blessed him there. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, and he says, I have seen God face to face. What does that mean? It means that Jacob determined that the one he was wrestling with was God. Now, if you remember, we talked about the, the Hebrew phrase, Malach Yahweh, which means the, the angel of the Lord. And we talked about the fact that in the Bible, most of the time, the word angel means a created being, an archangel, a cherub, a seraph. These are created beings, angels, but not always. The word angel simply means messenger. And sometimes the word angel, especially when the phrase is the angel of the Lord, does not mean a created being. It means an uncreated being. There's only one kind of uncreated being, and that's God Himself. And when we talked about, for instance, the angel of the Lord appearing to Hagar in Genesis 16, we came to the conclusion that when you put all the passages together, like Genesis 16, like Genesis 32, like Judges 13, other places in the Old Testament, we concluded that the visible God of the New Testament is Jesus of Nazareth. And the visible God of the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord. We also concluded that Jesus of Nazareth is the incarnate second person of the Trinity. The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate second person of the Trinity. When Jacob wrestled with this person, he said, I've wrestled with God. I've seen God face to face. He names the place Peniel. When we studied Genesis 28 in the end of John chapter 1, we said, the ladder, the staircase that Jacob saw in his vision in Genesis 28 was Christ. We may also conclude with reasonable assurance that the one whom Jacob wrestled with in Genesis 32 was Christ. It's an amazing thing. But when you put all the evidence together, and obviously we're looking at it very quickly, that's the conclusion that we come to. It says, when the sun rose up, verse 31, and he crossed over Penuel, he was limping. You know what limping is. He's walking, but he's not walking very well. He's got an injury. He's got a hurt leg. He can't walk quickly anymore. What did Jacob depend on to get what he want, wanted before? He was strong. How was he going to get away from Esau in Genesis 28? He was going to run fast. How was he going to get away from Esau in Genesis 32? Well, if he had to, he was going to run fast. But guess what? Now he can't run. Now he can only limp. I write a blog. The name of the blog is Jacob's Limp. A wound, an injury, a difficulty is a good thing if God gives it to us. A wound, an injury, a difficulty is a good thing if it makes us depend upon God and it makes us not depend on ourselves, Jacob can't run away anymore. He's been wrestling with God. And instead of God making him stronger, God made him weaker so that he would be forced to depend upon the strength of God. 
You see, if dependence is the objective, if the whole point is to teach us to depend on God, if dependence is the objective, then weakness is the advantage. If the thing I'm supposed to do is to learn how to depend on God's resources, then it will be a good thing that I don't have any resources of my own to depend on. Because the reality is, as long as I'm strong, I will depend upon my strength and not God's strength. When I'm truly weak, then I will learn to depend upon God's strength. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, when I am weak, then I'm strong. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians, God has manifested His strength through weakness. This is an incredible passage of Scripture. It's a very famous passage of Scripture. It's a passage of Scripture that the old painters used to love to paint the painting of Jacob wrestling with the angel. But this one is more than a man. This one is really even more than an angel. This is the very God who called Jacob, who named him, and who blessed him. So when Jacob leaves chapter 32, he's limping. He's physically weaker, but he's spiritually stronger. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. And in this diminished condition, in this condition of weakness when he can't run, he sees Esau. And the moment of truth has come. He sees Esau, and he sees the 400 men with him. So he divides up the children. He puts, Jake, he puts Rachel and Joseph last. But he goes out ahead of everybody and he bows down to his brother. Then something beautiful happens. Something really, really beautiful. Esau runs to meet him and embraces him, falls on his neck and weeps. Now, I want to say this. We spend a lot of time or some Bible teachers spend time trying to figure out if certain people in the Bible were really saved. I know of one famous Bible teacher who doesn't think that Adam and Eve will be in heaven. I think they will. But there's one very famous Bible teacher who thinks they will not. I know one Bible teacher who suggested that maybe Eve would be in heaven but not Adam. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? I think they'll both be in heaven. There are some people who think that uh, Lot will not be in heaven. I think he will be in heaven. There are some people who think Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel, will not be in heaven. I fear they may be right. I'm not sure Saul will be in heaven. He doesn't give us much hope. He really doesn't. Sometimes it's hard to figure these things out. Hard to know. Um, I know that David will be in heaven. I don't know for sure that Bathsheba will be there. Even though God really used her, even though Christ came through her, and she was Solomon's mother, and maybe Solomon was talking about her in Proverbs 31. Maybe she will be in heaven. Hopefully she will. Esau is one of those people that Bible scholars talk about. And there are passages in Scripture, including Hebrews chapter 12, which make us fear that perhaps Esau would not be in heaven. There's one passage that gives us great hope that Esau will be in heaven. And it's, it's this passage in chapter 33 of Genesis where Esau forgives his brother and he makes peace with him. The power of forgiveness comes from God. The power of forgiveness is not present in Islam. 
Forgiveness is not an ideal in Islam. Revenge is the great ideal in Islam. Forgiveness is something that God does. And let me just say this. I can't remember if I've already talked about this in the book of Genesis. If I have, forgive me for repeating it. We cannot forgive a deserving person. If a person deserves forgiveness, you can't forgive them. Because if, if they deserve forgiveness, it's not forgiveness. It's just understanding. You can only forgive a person who does not deserve forgiveness. That's what forgiveness is. Heaven is full of undeserving people. All the people in heaven are undeserving, but all the people in heaven are forgiven. The people in heaven are not getting what they deserve. The people in heaven are getting what Christ deserves. The people in hell are deserving, but they're unforgiven. Nobody gets anything in hell that he doesn't deserve. But nobody in hell is forgiven. That's why they're in hell, because they, they're not forgiven. So when we choose to forgive someone, we do a heavenly thing, and we do a Christ-like thing. And the reason to forgive is never based on that person's righteousness or that person's merit or desert. The reason to forgive is not found in the offender. The reason to forgive is found in Christ. Christ is the reason to forgive, not the person who offended us. And the beautiful thing about the beginning of Genesis 33 is somehow, some way, Esau found the grace to forgive. Now, all these presents that Jacob sent Esau, it raises an interesting question. Why did Esau want the blessing? Why did Esau want the inheritance? Did Esau want the spiritual benefits of being a child of Isaac and Abraham? I'm not sure he did. Hebrews 12 says that Esau was a profane person. That is, Esau really wasn't concerned about heavenly things, even though he did a heavenly thing in Genesis 33. The great attraction of the inheritance for Esau would have been the material benefits, the money. So what does Jacob give him? He gives him the material benefits. Not one gift, but two. Not two gifts, but three. Not three gifts, but four. Not four gifts, but five. Huge material benefits benefits of cattle, different animals, valuable animals who would reproduce and who uh, were worth much. So Jacob was giving a lot of the inheritance over to Esau. And Esau wept. Esau kissed him. Esau said, let me meet your family. The family bowed down. Um, to them, and um, Esau says, you know what, I don't really need your property. I don't really need material benefits because I have plenty, my brother. Verse 9, this is beautiful. I have plenty, my brother. Let what you have be your own. Now, and again, this gives me great hope because he didn't take the material benefit, but it also makes me feel doubtful because he, does, he didn't say God gave it to me. He just said, I have it. He didn't say, God gave it to me. Um, Jacob said, um, no, you, you need to take this gift. You need, you need to take it, and uh, you need to enjoy it. Um, then he did take it, verse 11. And that's really the way you bargain in the ancient Near East. You remember when Abraham was trying to buy a piece of land to bury Sarah in? And the man who owned the land said, oh, no, I'm not going to take your money. But he took it. And um, also Esau says, no, 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 I don't need that. But he took it. <laughs> if you bargain, especially with somebody you know in the Mideast, and uh, you say, what do you want for, get, for that? They'll say, oh, no, I want to give it to you as a gift. And you say, okay. Then they'll say, oh, that would be $50. <laughs> this is the way they do. 
They pretend they're going to give you something for free, or they pretend they're not going to take money, but they do. It's the way they think. We also saw the same kind of thing in Genesis 18 when Abraham is praying about the destruction of, of Sodom. Um, Jacob and Esau reconcile, but they separate. They're not going to try to live together. And Jacob settles in a place called Shechem in the land of Canaan. And there he meets um, a landowner in the area, somebody that he does business with called Hamor. He builds an altar there, and he calls the altar the God of Israel. 